Hey guys, welcome into another episode of From the Wing. I'm Christian Clark, the Pelicans beat writer for NOLA.com and the Times Picayune. The preseason is over. The regular season is a little less than one week away. I'm ready for some real basketball. I've got some takes, uh, a few I'm going to share just about the preseason, but I just don't think there's that much you can put into it. I don't really enjoy it. I mean, for me personally, like as someone who's writing every day, training camp is like a heavy lift. And you just can't have that strong of like opinions or conclusions because none of the real games have happened. So I'm ready to get into the real games. Look no further for like every undefeated preseason team ever. And that having zero correlation to the regular season, including the Pelicans themselves. Preseason does not matter. Um, I think the, you know, the thing we talked about that was like at least a little exciting is like game one. You just wanted to see like, what does Borrego want us to do? How is this going to look a little different? And we saw those things. And then everything after that was really just like kind of messy and all over the place. Zion's very good at basketball when his handle isn't trash. One of the games, his handle was awful, but he's looked great throughout. Um, so all what we know right now from what we have seen, the, the things that we can trust, one, Dyson looks pretty good. Herb looks very Herb. And this team goes as far as B.I. and Zion because that's what worked in the preseason games, too. Um, we will not get into very much Jalen Crutcher uh, breakdown on here, sadly. But, uh, you know, it, it's it's what we already knew. And we'll see if they clean up the, you know, kind of the system roles and everything. If everybody gets into their right slots and everything. I did enjoy seeing like Dyson and Herb get to play together a little bit and see if like, can that be viable because of what it does for you defensively, especially while Trey's not here. So we got some fun little nuggets, but yeah, the results truly don't matter. Yeah. I mean, look, those middle two games, um, take all that, that tape, that footage and bury okay. it and then nuke it like Oppenheimer because, Oh my <laughs> God. That that was some really rough stuff. Um, we're gonna yeah. we're gonna get in a little more like the preseason stuff and and looking forward. But I just wanted to take a few steps back before um, this is something I've been thinking about a lot. You know, as we head towards the start of this regular season and just the stakes of the 2023-2024 season for the Pelicans and why it kind of has big picture implications, really for just like professional basketball in new Orleans in general. Um, I've, I've reported before that the lease at smoothie King center is going to expire in June. Uh, ownership has said that their plan is basically, they're going to exercise an option to stay there for at least another five years. They're going to commission a study about the short term and the long term viability of, of smoothie King center as you know, an arena to house an NBA team. I think this is kind of all connected because like all, everything you hear behind the scenes is, the state of Louisiana just there is not an appetite really to put up any sort of significant money in in state funds for a new arena right now, right? Um, you know, the, the Saints are completing like this renovation of Caesar Superdome ahead of the Super Bowl, but there's not really political appetite for a lot of money for a new NBA arena right now. Um, I think one way that maybe there becomes an appetite for a new arena or a nice renovation in the future is to win a little bit, especially if you can win with a very exciting player like Zion Williamson. Um, and yeah, I mean, like I, I really think that like what happens this season, like it just, it just has, you know, potentially so many long-term implications with this franchise. Yeah, it's hard not to not to think that. I know I feel like maybe because that's been a like a theme in in a lot of the stuff you've written, it might stick out. Like I'm very much like ostrich head in the sand. I I don't want to know. I very much like I've complained about the arena. I made a joke about it last podcast that the one in Birmingham's better. Uh, and I know you can't comment on that, but um, I I would love to see something done. Like I'm resigned to the fact that a renovation is is the the only realistic way to go, um, and that they'd have to like just temporarily move out while a renovation happened, and they'd have to keep that same footprint and that 
probably that real estate synergy and everything like that would probably be very beneficial staying downtown all that uh, which i loved when i used to work in an office right next to it, it was pretty sick um it just you know it's funny still to hear like we're gonna commission the study you're already the worst arena in the league and you're gonna commission the study soon to talk about the possibility when in five years time you are going to be and and just a fossil compared to the next worst arena. You can um, you can make um, data and studies say anything you want to. And case in point is the NBA is saying actually our science is saying that load management was a bunch of BS. Now, <laughs> like I, I think you know on this podcast, like we've been on the side more of um, like especially in New Orleans, these guys could be playing more. And I think specifically in this market, a lot of it has been on the players. I think in other markets. A lot of it is team driven, um, but, but load manage it's, it's also not a, I mean, I don't think it's a bunch of fooey. I mean, I, I think there's like, like shades of, of gray here. Definitely. I mean, I think for one, like the season is just too long. Like 82 is too many with the way the game has changed, but yeah, you can, you can make numbers and studies say anything you want them to say basically, but only five years from now. Not right. Not right now, but in a, in a little bit. We'll get to it. We're getting to it. We're getting to it. Just down down the road a little bit. Yeah, and, and not uh this is definitely not a political podcast, but look, I I was uh among the small percentage of New Orleanians who voted for governor. I won't say who I voted for or anything. I think only 27% of us showed out to vote for governor. Uh Jeff Landry is Count going to be our governor. We are going to have a seems like a pretty far right. Um, like government in Louisiana for the next couple of years here. I don't know. I'm not a political analyst, but it, it seems like maybe a difficult environment to try to get a bunch of state money for new NBA arena, right? Yeah. Um. So the guy that got the job, like to not not to get into immense detail, we don't have to go into all the political doldrums. But very simply, regardless of what who you supported, who you voted for, the guy that won is a guy who has openly declared war on the city of New Orleans for several years. So you should not expect anything super positive that favors the city of New Orleans or that requires heavy funding for the city of New Orleans to, to happen. Um, you know, this guy withheld sewerage and water board funding because of some unkind comments. Like he, it's going to be an interesting time uh, in the city. And so, yeah, not an ideal, not an ideal scenario for, uh, for needing to stick our hands out to do anything in the city for the basketball team um, that's coming from anything public that the state has control over. It's not, not a, not the best person in the world for that. Yeah. That's, it's just a, a really tough sell. If you are um, part of Pelican's ownership and you're, tr you know, want to get a whole bunch of money from the state right now. It's like, well, we won like the best NBA draft ladder you could win in like 10 years, basically. But in those four years, like uh, that guy has basically missed 80% of the games. Our second best player has missed like 40% of the games the last two years. We've never finished higher than ninth. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a tough sell to be like, Hey, could we have like $700 million for a new stadium right now? Look, if you give it to us, we might contend for a title. And wouldn't that be fun? If if you build it, titles will come. Eh? That's probably not gonna work. <laughs> that's that's probably not gonna work. It it among one of the worst sports movies of all time that for whatever reason was successful, uh, that does not work. The the You're not a field of dreams and, guy then, huh? No. The uh, the giant spend does not happen before the success. The success has to come first. Everybody that wins has has done well right after the Bucks, the Warriors. Granted, the Warriors won a lot, um, but they also made this like giant multimedia year round money making arena where they're just printing. Like yeah, it's I mean, they, just rolling out. They they privately, uh, from my understanding, like they privately finance that that guy, like Joe Lacob and. Warriors ownership like paid for all of that basically. Um, and they own the building. So it seems like it's gonna work out for them long term. But oh yeah, that would uh 
that would not be the case here. I mean, I don't look, you know, I've written a lot about how like the Benson's bought the team for 338 million. It's probably worth like something like 1.8 billion right now. I mean, they've accumulated wealth on paper in that way, but they don't, I mean, they don't, they don't have like the liquid money to, you know, plunk down a $2 billion like Steve Ballmer is doing for the Intuit Dome. I mean, they don't have like $40 billion right. in Microsoft stock or anything like that. They could just sell off. For uh, a rainy day. So, you know, wealthy, but uh, not not rich like that. I mean, there really is kind of a, I mean, you know, there's like the, the old school, old guard owners in the NBA. And then there's like the people like Ballmer um, and Matt Ishbia and Phoenix are like, yeah, they are way, way richer um, than some of the old guard folks in the NBA. I apologize. I realized I just I just sniffed my bourbon before I drank it because I have it in the Glen glass. And I'm just <laughs> I just want to apologize because that was really pretentious. That's so. Yeah. Anyway, back. Yeah. So new age owners versus old. Um, yeah. And among the new age owners, um, all of them are putting out uh, self uh, self-managed streamers and and packages and local cable packages you can watch the jazz and the timberwolves and, and in addition to the suns you can get a a direct you know from the team a uh, viewing package they're they're out there ready to do it already and we are not and bally's continues despite bankruptcy as we've talked about amply so yeah, the the younger the younger folks are uh, upsetting the apple cart significantly, as are the uber wealthy owners, and some of the younger ones are the uber wealthy, and then there's everybody and Balmer. So and, yeah, and it's an and interesting tr- time to try to, to it, attempt to to land the plane here on like this this big picture idea. Uh, Gail Benson has said before she's not selling the team while she's alive. Um, I think that's great that she's just like provided people that peace of mind that, you know, while Gail Benson is in charge of this team, it is not going anywhere. Like I, I seriously do commend her for, for saying that, um, Gail Benson's 76 years old. And, you know, like if you just look like Google billionaires in Louisiana, there's not that many of them. I mean, this is just not a state with like a lot of mega wealthy people. Um, so I think that you know, getting a new arena or doing a significant renovation in Smoothie King Center in the next few years is pretty critical because that's a major reason to keep the team here, right? I mean, if they have some halfway decent digs, it's a reason to actually keep the team here. Um, you know, so I, I think that's like all of why this year's potentially is so important. And it, like, if they have a bad year, it doesn't, like, I'm not saying that oh, the Pelicans are doomed. Like, you know, it's like, this is a doomsday scenario. I'm not saying that, but uh, what I am saying is these are extremely important next few years and like getting something out of Zion Williamson, like getting something out of getting that number one pick with a 6% chance at this guy who had one of the greatest college seasons ever. It's very important. Like we got to get something out of him. Yeah, you can't, you can't be the team, regardless of whether this is the correct way to tell the story or not. You can't be the team that keeps winning the first pick of the lottery and then, you know, not getting the most out of that talent and then that talent going elsewhere and performing. You can't continue to be that. And we've got a couple of bites of that apple now. So, you know, this one's very self-induced. You know, this one is a lot on the player, and we'll see how that turns out this year. Hopefully, this is the first, like, significantly different approach, both for him and the team in relation to their sports science. Hopefully, it yields a different result. We have no idea. Um, what we do know is that regardless of his conditioning, if he gives an effort on both ends of the court, good things are going to happen. Uh, really, really good things that oh, he a one of one person can do. So we just gotta hope. Uh, I, there's nothing. There's no nothing big and scientific. I can't give you this big logical explanation for why everything's gonna go well this year. I have no idea. Um, I'm glad that injuries seem to be subsiding right as the season's starting. Um, we're still gonna miss Trey for a little bit. Hopefully, that ends up being an end of November, but it's probably beginning of December. And, you know, 
we're, we we have a lot of hope. It's this is the preseason. Season hasn't started yet. This is a time for optimism. Every I don't have a ton of it, but a little. Well, let me give you a little bit. A little bit. E- everything I've heard about Zion in training camp is he looks motivated. Like he looks motivated to shut up some of the haters and doubters. And like frankly, that a lot of the haters and doubters are justified. Um, but everything I've heard. You know, like I think Trajan Langdon had that quote at me today of like, he's coming with an edge. I think that's accurate. Um, all the stuff I've heard kind of off the record is like, yeah, he's going pretty hard in some of these practices. Like he looks like he has something to prove. Um, that's been encouraging to me. He looks a little big right now, but that like, you know what? He hasn't played basically in 10 months. He, he's just going to have to play himself into shape. I've accepted that. Um, I'm Shaq did it for forever. And he's scrunched down Shaq. Um, yeah. So I am, I guess, a little bit encouraged. Here's my thing with Zion. Like, dude, I can always talk myself into Zion. I just, I can't quit him. I I really can't, man. I mean, I, like, he is Neither my, can we contractually. He is my Sharon Stone and Casino. It's like, I, man, this has been so bad for me. I know this probably doesn't end well, but I can't quit you. I love you, yeah, Ginger. I'm, this is uh this is you know Jenny uh having uh having diseases and a son at the end of Forrest Gump and Forrest is still there. He needs after all that, after as many times as she left him, and as 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 many awful things as she's done, he's still here. He's Diane still here. was singing Freebird Topless in the <laughs> That is not reporting. <laughs> that's that is not real reporting disclaimer i can i can just uh, always talk myself in, in, into zion and like yeah one of the the things that i came away from these four preseason games thinking is look i i, I know willie green wants like kind of an equal opportunity offense and he wants it set up in a way to where like if you remove one of the pieces there is not c- catastrophe basically like there was last year when he removed the Zion element from the situation, like the offense just fell off a cliff. I I'm with that. Like they should have a structure at the same time. I'm like, if you, if one person should dominate the ball more than any of the others, like if one person should lead the team and like percentage of possessions initiated, I feel like it should be Zion because he's just, yeah. he's like, it seems like to me, he's like head and shoulders, the best initiator on the team. And like, if there's anything to take, you know, it's fine to get upset about like little things that happened in the preseason. As long as you don't get carried away, it was ridiculous that for a half he got one shot. That 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 is something that just can't happen. And it, you know, it didn't happen again, and it very likely won't happen again. And part of that's got to be on on Zion to demand that the ball come his way. Um, and you know, we've talked about that a ton, the type of personalities that are on this team. It's a lot of guys who don't really talk, who don't have the big boisterous personality and, you know, neither did Hakeem Olajuwon. And there's, there are stories of him going into a locker room and cursing out everybody for not giving him the ball. Like even the quietest guys that were, that were real stars. There's all sorts of stories about dudes lighting up a locker room because I need to get the ball. So Zion's going to have to do some of that too. Like he, he is as much to blame for not touching the ball more than uh, as much as they are. And I get that we have a system. And like you said, like when it comes to like when they get bogged down, when there are injuries, when there's a team that matches up against as well and the offense isn't clicking the break glass in case of fire is Zion with the ball in his hands. And that needs to also remain a default, even though you're following system principles, when things go to shit, a little post touch for JV might be the way out. Nine times out of ten, the way out is just give his eye on the ball and let him do his thing. Dude, he I mean, it, it's just kind of ridiculous, like the the gravity he has as a downhill driver. And one of one of the other things I've I've picked up during training camp is I feel like Zion wants to be a leader and he knows he can't because of like the way the last four years have gone. And I think he knows he can't because like it, you can't really be a leader when you just never play. Like you have to be on the court to, to be a leader. 
Um, but I think like everything I've kind of gathered is like he he is working towards doing that. Um, and like maybe, maybe he he has that in him, like the alpha thing. I mean, Brandon Ingram, like beloved teammate, really well liked guy, great sense of humor, easygoing guy. I just I just don't think he has that in him. You know, it's just it's just not really who he is. So I think there is kind of like a void there if Zion could become that guy and it would it would be great. I think that was, you know, as we talked about this summer, one of the reasons the Pelicans were interested in Scoot Henderson. I mean, incredible talent, but also like could be a culture setter as one of your best your best players. Um but I think Zion, if he can stay in the freaking court, like maybe could become that guy. I don't know. I just it it feels like there are so many um just ways this season could go. Like the Pelicans feel like the highest variance team in the NBA to me. Which shocker is that not the story of the last however many seasons? Like it just it always feels this way here now. Like basically since Zion arrived, that's the story of Zion. It could be incredible or it could be a complete flop. It's the story of him in basketball. And, you, and like, if you're like a person who's like trying to make predictions about this team, like me, it's like, there's a man, you could look stupid because it could really go either way and it could be extreme. Yeah. And it like, no one should be shocked if they win less than 40 games. And also like, no one would be that surprised if they won 51 or 52, because I think everybody believes that if Zion plays 65 games that they're going to win the majority of those games. I think people believe that. I think people still believe that we have a really deep roster full of dudes that other teams want to have. And it's more full than it was. You know, we saw good minutes, like granted preseason minutes, but we saw capable play from Hawkins and Liddell and Dyson. Dyson's going to be in the rotation period. Like that's just, that's happening. And he looked really comfortable in roles that asked for more from him. So it's, it just, it looks like he's earned some more minutes. Some people are, look like they're falling by the wayside, but like I saw a capable play from Liddell in a role that we would use him in and Hawkins really like his shot turned around and you see that super quick trigger and you're like, shit, I know exactly how you're going to use him too. And we need that volume. We need that three point attack, especially while Trey's not here. So there's a door open for him as well. Hawkins Hawkins led the Pelicans in three point attempts in the preseason. He got 30 of those bad boys. Um, I know like he had some not great performances, but I, I just believe in Hawkins. I like when I just see it, I I just believe it's like in my gut. Uh it's kind of interesting. I mean, Zion was asked it after practice, like, is there one guy who stood out for you during camp? And he said, Jordan Hawkins. Um, so maybe Zion is a believer too. I I just like trust Hawkins with the outside shot. He's not afraid to get them up. Obviously I believe they're going to go in. I think he's going to be able to do some stuff off the dribble and time. Definitely got to bulk up a little bit. Um, but my, my concern until Trey Murphy gets back, my number one concern about this team is do you just have enough outside shooting? Um, because in the preseason, Brandon Ingram took 11 threes. Like there's a lot of talk of, we want him shooting between six and eight threes this year. You know, it's only the preseason who knows how much stocking, but it, like we didn't really see that from him. Um, and there just isn't that much shooting elsewhere, man. I mean, they just don't have a lot of it and they're going to need it. And they, they start three guys in the starting lineup who I think you could classify three of them as reluctant three point shooters in, in Herb, Zion and NJV. I think Herb's looked a little better. I'm going to, I'm prepared to pull that moniker off of Herb. Like I, I, we're, we're still there because it hasn't happened in the regular season yet, but he shot his way through one of the worst shooting downturns of a Pelican of the, of the last few years, last season. And really like from the beginning of March forward shot above his career average, the rest of the way. And it's looked even better in the preseason. His shot form looks more consistent he does not like when he gets hurried up, he doesn't all of a sudden lose his mechanics, which when he was in that the the doldrums last year, he, you know, every shot that came out of his hand looked different. His legs looked different, his prep looked different, his release point was different. Like it was a mess. It does not look like that. And he's firing that thing quick, especially, you know, closer to the corners. He's I find that he's never 
he's never completely in the corner because of it, like what his assignments tend to be. And he's not exactly on the wing. He ends up like right in between, usually on the left side. And he's not hesitating. So I'm waiting to pull that off of him. And I think, like you said, the, the one thing, you know, the volume from BI hasn't been there, but the type of three point takes that he's taken have have made me happy because they were ones he was not taking last season, like early clock stuff, pull ups in transition. Like that's the kind of stuff. Like sometimes when you're playing at this rapid speed, you need a quick bucket and you need it from the guy that can shoot it. They didn't go down like for the 11 that he took, they did not go down, (laughs) but I was happy with the type of threes that they were. um, And that he was willing to take a type of three that he had no interest in last season. And then you have CJ and you just got to hope that post hand surgery that he can still shoot it um, and that they're going to go down. And he like he looks fine. You know, he's an easy target for people to to rip on because of his salary number and his age. And last year with the thumb, um, I know you and I feel differently about him because we we care a lot about the intangibles that he's been asked to bring to the table. Um, I You know, I'm excited to see what happens when Zion is using his gravity consistently and creating open looks for dudes that historically can shoot. So, you know, and then Jose, you're going to get him back. And, you know, if anything, you need to tell, tell Jose not to shoot sometimes. So, you know, he'll put it up from the wing. So yeah, it's going to be scary. It's gonna be a little scary. You're going to need Herb to take some attempts. You're going to need BI to, to actually get the six and seven attempts. You're going to need CJ to shoot probably more than you want. And JV's probably going to have to get two or three up a game to to make it work when Trey's not there, just so that you're not getting killed in the math. That's that's one thing I've heard from the Pelicans is like they some people feel like JV is is going to get them up this year, and I mean I hope they're right. I mean JV is definitely trying. You know he talked during training camp about like he understands that Zion is this very unique offensive player and that it is critical for JV to keep the floor space for him. We saw, you know, here and there of JV, like being out beyond the corner and all that. Um, So I think like there's, they're saying a lot of the right things. JV is really trying. I mean, what is JV in year 11? I just, I don't know. I guess I'm a, like, I, I think he can, he's going to try and, you know, maybe, maybe he makes like 50 or 83s or somewhere in that ballpark, but it's just hard for me to see him becoming like, you know, having the brick Lopez Renaissance when he went to, yeah, that's not to Milwaukee or, or anything. That, like I mean, that. that's not happening though. Cause like the, while we, we wish that he could turn into Brooke Lopez, Brooke Lopez did that over the course of several years. Like JV's proven that he can make it when it's open. Like if they leave him open, he can put it down. I think the interesting thing this year is that positionally, this the offensive principles that we're already seeing are going to ask for him to be in position and touch the ball in those places more often than in the past. So it's really just like, is he going to, is he going to put it up or not? You know, it's going to be the same question we had about Jackson Hayes a couple of years ago. Like you basically, if you want to be out on that floor, you're going to have to shoot it. And in, in games that mattered, Jackson didn't want to shoot it. Um, it's so, been really funny seeing like the Jackson Hayes highlights hit the, hit the timeline and Lakers fans being like, Oh my God, this guy can put the ball on the floor. Vicious oh, yeah. dunker. Like oh, he's yeah. basically Gumby with how flexible he is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's, he's not a baby deer at all. He knows exactly what he's doing. Him and Christian Wood holding down the center position when their best player is a center who doesn't want to play it. We're back to that again. We hired two centers, two guys to play center. I love it. Can't wait. It's certainly going to go incredibly well, and they're going to hit the over. I I do think the Lakers are going to be good this year. Unfortunately, I I do think they're going to be good. It kind of I think they're going to. I think we're going to land in a very similar place to last season. They do not have a lot of mechanics to get a lot better. I don't think. I think the moves that they've made are fine, but a little overrated. And they're going to get to the playoffs. They're going to be a hard out for everybody. But I don't think their championship potential has shifted at all. I really don't. I think they are a a top 15 team for sure. And in the West, probably a top four or five team. But they are not a top two team. Okay. 
and I don't and I don't know that there's going to be like a giant path. Like the, if the Zach Levine thing would have happened, like the thing that everybody tried to make happen, where Zach Levine somehow ends up a Laker, then I look. I, I got a little bit of territory on Zach Levine Island if he got onto a decent team. I got I got a little bit of little bit mm. of property there. I think he's better than a lot of people think he is. Um, I've all I've kind of thought that since Minnesota traded him to Chicago. Um, you know annual member of my fantasy basketball team where I will once again beat Mason Ginsburg and Jake Madison. Just putting that out there. I only ended up with one Pelican this year. This is everybody's favorite segment where I talk about my fantasy team, but we just drafted auction style and I didn't plan on doing this, but they let JV go for six bucks. So I needed some rebounds, needed a dude that wouldn't kill my free throws. JV satisfies those things. So, Hey, Six bucks of JV, grabbed a cheap Chris Paul, threw that on top of a little little Damian, like an expensive Damian Lillard. But you know, Damian Lillard, Lil, uh, Lillard, blah, 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 blah. Damian Lillard, and Anthony Edwards and Paul George are my core. Okay, we're punting field goals. I think I did pretty good. I'm pretty happy with it. I, I got a lot of feisty guards. I got a lot of really feisty guards. Some nice high end scoring at the top of the roster. Spent pretty equitably. I'm probably I'm, I've probably messed up a little bit towards the end, but it's like $2 transactions. But yeah, so I got a Pelican. I probably should have taken CJ because I kicked field goals, but you know, I got JV and, and and we'll ride with it. Sadly, I missed out on our guy, Scoot. I, I went hard after him, but yeah, auction style, man. If he gets up, he gets up to 28, 29 bucks. Like you're eating my keeper value. What am I supposed to do there? <laughs> I can love the guy as much as I want, but Wemby went for 47 and and Scoot goes for 29. What am I supposed to do? I, I think the single thing I'm looking forward to in the regular season is Wemba Nyama because holy crap, dude. dude. The, the highlights from the preseason. I mean, he nutmegged the guy last night. A seven foot four Not guy. Not just a guy. Reggie Bullock, a good defender. <laughs> Reggie Bullock is a good defender and Reggie Bullock thought it was a good idea to spread his legs out to try and take away the angles around him. And Wemby just saw food like preseason may not matter. Did one, one like, Yama, holy shit. he does the thing where he just dunks it without really jumping, which yeah. is just, it's so unfair. And like, there's, there's been those guys in the NBA, right? But like they can't dribble. They don't move very well. They definitely yeah. can't shoot. And Wembenyama does like all that stuff. And he can just yeah. basically dunk without even jumping. So like the, the big preposterous question lurking in the background here is like, sure. A lot of people look at him and you think of tall guys that can play and you're like, Oh, like, you know, maybe it's Dirk ish. Maybe it's something like that. Like maybe that's his ceiling. Like what if he's seven, five Durant? Like, what if that's the thing? What if, what if that's what he is? That's, yeah, that's I mean, that's, not a, that's, that's too not much real that's life. Too, I mean, that's too much to ask of him offensively, but also, I mean, he's like a best but he's, handle, though. Yeah, but, but the other thing too is like, I think he's going to be a way better defender than Durant ever was. And especially at the beginning of his career. Like, that's how they're yeah, different. Well, yeah. So, but that's, so that's the thing. I'm, I'm saying like relative talent. So, like, Take the take the the sliders and and take take KD and slide up. KD's no defensive slouch, um, especially no. like in the middle of his career and and now like because of that length, like the the unavoidable length. Where like Wemby as well doesn't want to be doesn't want you to say he's seven five. He wants you to say he's seven four because he doesn't want to be too tall. Kevin Durant also doesn't want people to know how tall he is. He'd rather be six eleven. Like it's. It's funny how that works for like the hyper tall guys because the super tall guys don't normally work out like this. Um, he's really exciting. And the question is still like that body's really, really lean. And what happens when a lot of dudes start burying shoulders in his chest? Because that is coming. And yeah. that is the thing we did not see in the preseason that we will immediately see from every giant every redwood shaped center in the league is gonna bury a shoulder you're gonna see three four post touches with dudes like a Jonas Valanciunas that have nice post moves and really strong body work and he's gonna get some elbows in the ribs and we're gonna have to see what happens and I gotta say 
the little bit of it that you did see in the preseason, I did see Wemby flying back a little bit when somebody put a shoulder into him. So I think that's going to, that's going to be the one issue. So the, the Spurs have been starting Zach Collins at center, Wemby at power forward. Sohan got some run at like point guard, but he's starting at point guard. They came out and said it. Oh, amazing. I love it. My, my question is, I mean, the Pelicans and the Spurs are obviously in the same division. Are, are Wemby and Zion going to be like guarding each other from the jump when they play? I mean, they're technically both fours. I mean, pretty different body types, pretty different body types, but uh, they're kind of both fours for their team. Question everybody's going to ask on a nightly basis. What the hell do we do here? I don't know. Your yeah. biggest guy, your fastest guy, your guy who's six, seven and whatever. I don't know. I don't know how you decide. You you choose. It's going to take three of you. Figure it out. Do you do you think Zion like uh like wants to like does it have anything special for like Paulo Bancaro, like former both Duke guys, number one pick? Like, do you think do you think he plays a little bit harder like when he sees like that guy who could be kind of next, you know? He definitely had a lot of steals in that Orlando game. And yeah. he looked like he was ripping the ball out with a little bit of hate. Because because so, where where I'm going with this is like I think I think like a lot of the takes this year are going to be like Wemba Nyama, uh, you know, like a phenom like like Zion, but he actually cares about maximizing his career and like taking care of his. Like I think we're going to get some of those takes basically of like we're gonna this singular yeah. talent, but like he's actually doing everything he can to maximize his career. And like I, I'm just wondering if Zion will like maybe hear some of that noise and like like you know, try to, try to come for Wemba Nyama, like nuke him into the rim. Basically you, he's coming for him anyway. Like think about Rudy Gobert. Like when we saw Zion play against him, what's the first thing we saw him do? He, he went straight into Rudy's chest and sent him into the fans. He's going to try that on everybody, especially a rookie, especially a, you know, mythical an already mythical figure. Who's, you know, hasn't played a regular season NBA game yet. Yeah. He's going to do it what reasons he'll do it for who knows, but he will do it. What woman Yama like seems too good to be true, man. Like some of the stuff you read about him is like, yeah, he was reading a game of Thrones novel in not his native language. It's like, what the hell bro? Like when I was, when I was uh 19 and 20, I was doing a lot of the same stuff that Zion was just way, way less money. I was not reading game of Thrones in Spanish. I'll put it to you like that. Look, the dude, like, I felt like we were in trouble as soon as I heard that he was skipping FIBA to do to just go to the Spurs immediately and work out with the team. I was like, oh, shit, this dude like I already told you on a past podcast that I felt like I expect him to be an uber professional and be ready for all this crap because the stuff I've seen over the last year suggests he's ready. The way he's handled the media, the way he's handled conversations leading up to this, like he just sounds like he knows what he's getting into. He sounds like he's already a mythical figure. And yeah, that that decision, I was just like, oh, shit, he's going to do everything right, too. <laughs> On top of that, he's going to do everything right. He's working out with Manu and Tim already. God damn it. It's uh, it's not good. It's not looking good for the league. Uh, he he's going to do things. He's going to do a lot of things and it's going to be bad for a lot of teams, especially the ones in, uh, in that, that side of the league. So I'm going to resist good. the temptation to contrast that with, uh, the, the way that the superstar, the New Orleans market has prepared. Uh, I'm just going to say that everything you've heard in training camp is he has looked extremely motivated. I, I do think it's true that he is entering this season with a chip on his shoulder. And I'm glad he should feel like that after the, the way the last few years have gone. I hope it translates into him staying on the court. Please basketball gods help us out. Like we, we need some of that luck. Zion, um, no more Wendy's drive through ever for the rest of your life. Um, and yeah, I mean, if he, if he plays upwards of 60 games, they're probably going to be pretty good. Chip on his shoulder, but maybe it's no longer Doritos. <laughs> or maybe it is. I don't I, I I don't know. I've I've given up trying to predict what's gonna happen. I, I have no idea. I uh I know John Hollinger is not always kind to the Pelicans, but I felt like uh the blurb he wrote 
um, when he's going through all the Western Conference teams was pretty good. I'll read it to you here. There are no bad predictions when it comes to this year's Pelicans. You could tell me literally anything about what might happen to this team in 2023-24, and I would believe it. The top seed in the West and an MVP run for Zion Williamson? Sure. Finishing 8-74 and because every single player on the team had a season-ending injury after an initial diagnosis of being out for two to four weeks, of course, and they're forced to woo Nicola Melli back from Europe just to fill out the roster? Not going to rule that one out either. <laughs> Melly, uh, actually, just stay over there. <laughs> yeah, um, I uh, I've once been accused of Nicola Melli being my favorite player on this team. It was an unjust accusation at the time. All that happened was that I ran into him while eating at a restaurant that it was in the bottom of his apartment, and he came out and I said hey to him and I told the guys like, "Hey, looks like he's in pretty good shape. Looks like he's pretty lean." And then things didn't go well for him that season. It is what it is. But uh, you know, he can, he absolutely can stay where he is. I don't I don't I don't need that in my life again. All right, Adam. I guess I'm gonna go watch the Saints game. Um I don't know. Uh, you think they're gonna beat Jacksonville? Well, so Jacksonville's like never won in the Superdome or like hasn't won. Or they're have they oh and three? I read some sort of stat where they never win in the Superdome, which of course means they will. Um, because you're, you're starting for the Saints at left guard tonight, right? I look, don't get me started. Quick Saints nugget, and then I'll I'll shut up. But okay. the idea, the idea that you draft a first round left tackle, and after five games you're ready to bench him, that's not on him. That's on you. So the, the all the mechanics they're going through to force him not to start at left tackle. There are so many linemen that have been picked in the NFL draft in the first round that had not been good their first year. And you stick it out with them and they get better. Garrett Bowles is one that really sticks out. He was really terrible for the Broncos after he got drafted. Small school guy, but, a, but kind of a monstrous dude. The next season, markedly better. Cesar, uh, Cesar Ruiz, who plays for us, was atrocious. And then he became a passable guard. It is psychotic that they spent the capital to get that guy and now are jumping through hoops to take the most athletic person on that line, off that line, after six games. He's got offensive lineman takes, you guys. Psychotic. Fire He's got everybody. them all. Fire everybody. Wow. Strong. Um, okay. This is the last one we're going to do before the regular season starts. We will, uh, we'll huddle back up after the Memphis game next week. We appreciate you guys listening. We'll talk to you again soon.